Welcome to Life with the Spectrum. I'm your host, Gina Cavalli, and my guest needs no introduction, researcher, scientist, best-selling author on the New York Times list, and one of Time's most influential people, Temple Grandin. Thank you for being here today. It's great to be here. I'm so happy you're here. with How was your holidays? Well, we had good holidays. Uh, fortunately, I was on United Airlines, and uh, all the mess with Southwest, I avoided <laughs> that. Um, I just couldn't believe it. One, they're still canceling flights today. Isn't that crazy? I know it was a big debacle for sure. Well, they have a antiquated crew scheduling program. They should have gotten rid of years ago. Well, Temple, I know that 2023 is looking bright for you. In addition to all of your public speaking engagements, you also go and you meet with children, future farmers of America, don't you? Yeah, future farmers of America. I always like talk 4-H, done talks with them. I've done talks in schools. I'd say last year I probably visited with about three or four FFA groups. Because I figure now at my age, I want to encourage the younger generation because they're going to be the leaders for, for tomorrow. And what would you say to parents? This actually came in from a viewer. What would you say are some of the biggest advice you could give to parents who have children on the spectrum? First of all, I've got to give advice by age. I'm, I kind of have standard advice for three-year-olds that are not talking. You need to get into therapy immediately. And if you're in a place where there's no therapy, then enlist some grandmothers in the neighborhood. They know how to work with children, start teaching language, turn taking and skills like eating and dressing. Um, I find uh, good teachers have the knack. I don't care what their training is. Some teachers have the knack to work with these kids and engage them because the worst thing you can do with an autistic three year old is to do nothing. Now, I didn't talk until I was four years old. Wow. And I had very good early, early, early speech therapy starting at two and a half. So that's for little two and three year olds and four year olds. Okay, now when kids get older, um, we need to be emphasizing the things they can do. Okay. I was very good at art. That showed up at around age eight. And my mother always encouraged my ability in art. And I would just draw the same old thing over and over again. So she didn't say, well, let's draw the whole horse, not just the head, draw the stable. Let's draw where we ride it to. In other words, take that interest and broaden it, broaden those interests develop them. Teenage years, worst part of my life, bullying and teasing. Um, oh, only places I the was bullying. Bullied. Oh, it's terrible. And the only place I was not bullied was friends through shared interests. I cannot emphasize that enough. And in high school for me, it was horseback riding, model rockets and electronics. For another kid, it might be art. It could be theater. It could be music. But that's where they're going to get friends. And then I had a wonderful science teacher mentor who got me motivated to study. I really want to emphasize mentors. And then there was a contractor who saw my skills. They'd seen my drawings. And this is one of my oh. drawings right here, one of my books. Um, and he seeked me out to design jobs for him. Wow, isn't that incredible? Well, you see, that's showing the work. I'm a big believer in showing portfolios of work because I designed the front end of every Cargill plant in North America for beef. And the way I got that job was sending a drawing, very similar to like this one here, to the head of Cargill. That's how I, I showed my work. That was, I showed my work and and then also, um, I was a terrible student. My school put me to work running the horse barn, cleaning stalls, so I learned how to work. It's another <laughs> big problem. These kids aren't learning how to work. I'm seeing too many teenagers fully verbal. They've never gone shopping. I was shopping by the time I was eight years old and learning how to save money. Do you feel like the transition from school to adulthood then is we're not doing our, our young adults a service or a justice by getting them out in the workforce earlier, by helping them take control. What do you think is the most difficult part of transitioning and how can we help? What we need to do, slow transitions work better. So let's look at my transition from the world of school to the world of work. Okay. And mother got me a job when I was 13 with a seamstress that just uh, worked on dresses out of her home and I hemmed the dresses and took apart dresses. That was something just done in the neighborhood, two afternoons a week during the summertime. 
I was also, by the time I was uh, 15 years old, I was uh, running, basically running a horse barn. Wow. See, I was learning work skills. Then I had a little freelance sign painting business. And this is where you have to learn to do work that other people want. And my first paying client was a hair salon. So I made a sign that they would want, and I put the Breck lady, the Breck shampoo lady on. <laughs> I remember Breck I shampoo. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's really dating ourselves now. <laughs> but it's learning how to do work that other people would want. And this is where I'm really seeing a problem. Adults going from the world of school to the world of work. Let's start with chores for little kids. And then um, another thing that was done in my generation, all children had to do it, is that when I was seven or eight years old, me and my sister had to put on our good clothes and be the party hostess at my mother's party. Shake hands, kiss That's babies. Right. That taught social skills. And I was shopping by myself for little comics and things like that when I was eight, nine years old. You see, we're not, this is where we're falling down on the transition from world of school to the world of work. And when you, when did you feel like you kind of got a calling mm -hmm. towards animals, towards the farm? You said by 15, you were practically running your own horse barn. Were you called to animals at a young age? Well, I got exposed. No, it started all in high school. Okay. Pretty much all the horse stuff started in high school. See, this get, goes back to exposure. Kids get interested in things they get exposed to. Then I went to my aunt's ranch. That got me exposed to the West. That was when I was a teenager. And you worked on that ranch. Yes, I did. You know, I got exposed. And she had a guest ranch. And I took guests on trail rides. I had to like, then they had the kids dining room. I had to help run that. <laughs> you know, that's learning work skills. And, and it's not the same skills as academic skills. So what would you say then you had this calling towards animals and then you went from horses to cattle? First of all, I got exposed to cattle. I, oh, cannot okay. emphasize, I cannot emphasize the importance of exposure. I just went to that movie, The Fablemans. That's about Steven Spielberg's childhood. And I, I fact checked it extensively and it's 90% of it's true. But one of the most important things in that movie was exposure to movie cameras really young. And he made a movie at age 12 of crashing toy trains. And they got the idea from a movie, he saw in a movie theater called The Greatest Show on Earth where a circus train crashed. You see, that's a perfect example of exposure. And then he was mentored and encouraged. Hmm. And he was making movies as a Boy Scout, as a teenager. Wow. And and do you have any horses now out in Colorado? No, I don't now. I'm I um, I'm pretty much now just you know I'm doing a lot of speaking, a lot of traveling. Yes, you are very busy. <laughs> so I wrote this book, Visual Thinking. Betsy Lerner and I did this during the COVID shutdown, and the things that talk about is different ways of think. The people on the autism spectrum, some of us are object visualizers, really really good at visualization. It's going to make you good with animals, but also make you very good with mechanical things because you can just see how things work. Right. Absolutely can't do algebra. Yeah, there are and different really, types of thinkers for sure. There's the yeah, visual ones. Right. There's the ones that read the text that, that, you know, for me, I was a more visual rather than text kind of learner and still am today, really. And we need all the different kinds of minds. When we get back with Temple, we're going to find out more about this visual thinking book that she authored. Hold on. I'm Lyra Gillenwater. Thanks for checking out this episode of Life with the Spectrum. If you subscribe to the channel, you'll always see the newest episodes when they come out. Thanks again for joining us with Life with the Spectrum. I'm here with Temple Grandin. You came up with a book during COVID called Visual Thinking, and we were just talking about some of the types of visual thinking, and I noticed in a PowerPoint presentation they had your brain scans in yeah, there. Can right. you tell me a little bit more about brain scans? Because I've heard many parents are going and getting their kids' brains scanned because then they can come up with a, a real practical um, avenue of maybe teaching them or well, they have first of all they have to do the right kind of brain scans okay and just the regular gray MRI of anatomy doesn't show any of this stuff but brain scans that were done on me with what's called DTI imaging 
showed massive visual thinking circuits, massive. And I um, absolutely can't do algebra, nothing to visualize. And I'm concerned my kind of mind's going to get screened out. And I have a whole chapter in my visual thinking book that's called Screened Out because I wouldn't be able to graduate from school in California because of the math requirements. And they think that you have to have that algebra to think logically. That is if you are a visual spatial pattern thinker. You see, I think in pictures, I'm an object visualizer. Another kind of mind is the pattern thinker. And then of course you have word thinking minds. And then a lot of people are mixtures. But you take a person that's got a special ed label, autism or some other thing, that the, they tend to be more specialized in their thinking. And one of the things that really bothers me is we have a big skill loss issue right now. That's why I wrote this book. How so? Well, you want to build a poultry processing plant today? You've got to import all the equipment from Holland. And we're paying the price for taking out the shop classes. Yeah. So people like me are just getting addicted to video games in the basement. We ought to be building things. I spent 25 years in heavy construction because I would design, I'd sell a system, do the drawings, supervise construction, and then start it up. And I worked with people who owned metal fabrication shops, had multiple patents, and I'm going to estimate that 20% of them were either autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. Mm. And they owned businesses. And a lot of it went back to a single shop class in welding or growing up working on cars. In other words, exposure wow. to these mechanical things. You know, early. Tinkering around when at a young age with building blocks and then moving into a little bit uh, of heavier machinery well, or I'm whatnot. Not, I like that. I was using tools by second grade. I'm seeing kids are really good with Legos and nobody thought to introduce tools. And they're now a teenager. Legos are great, but let's introduce tools. I was using ham, hammer, screwdriver and pliers when I was in second grade. It's funny. I have um, nieces that have a 3D printer and they love Legos so much. Now they're printing their Good. own Legos Good. because they're using their minds and Good. the machinery and the computer software to do just that. And then they need to make up their own designs and you have to design them right so they don't collapse. Like, let's say you want to make an airplane. Well, you better make some posts to support the wings, otherwise it collapse when you print it. <laughs> so you said you had a mentor in construction. Do you feel like they helped you move from, I guess, mechanics more into um, developing this the squeeze machine and whatnot? Well, what happened with the with the contractor was um, he'd seen my drawings, and here's an example of some of my drawings. This is in my Thinking in Pictures book. And he seeked me out. He was a former Marine Corps captain, and he was starting a small steel and concrete construction company. And he approached me in the early 70s about designing jobs for him and selling jobs. And he was a very important mentor. He also showed me, how do you set up a business? I had no idea how to set up a business. And he referred mm. me to his lawyer to help me actually set up a business. Wow. But this is extremely important mentoring. Yeah. Don't you wish everybody had that, whether they were on the spectrum or neurotypical? It's always great to have a mentor. Well, one of the things is mentors get attracted to talent. If Michelangelo was here today, he was a grubby little 12-year-old, dropped <laughs> out of school. Where would he end up today? Right. Naughty little 12-year-old, too. But he grew up exposed to great art. Every church was commissioning it. And he grew up with stone cutting tools. It starts with exposure. And then an artist took him into his shop and mentored him and apprenticed him. You mentioned Steven Spielberg had gotten uh, kind of exposed to all those cameras. What do you feel about Hollywood's portrayal of ASD through shows like Atypical and Extraordinary Attorney Wu? I, I don't know if you've watched any of those, but how do you feel about those? Well, I think it's good that, you know, they're portraying these things. Of course, the first thing was Rain Man, and that only portrayed a very specific savant type autistic, which most people are not. I'm definitely not like Rain Man. But... You know, showing these things, you know, it's it's a good thing. And but what concerns me today is the number of adults that haven't made the transition successfully into the work world, living independent. Gradual transitions are also always better. Yeah. So let's start with um, volunteer jobs at around 11, like a church social, a farmer's market, a, a selling candy for charity. 
things where they start learning some work skills. And instant illegal, they need to get real jobs. And let's avoid the chaos multitasking. Uh, McDonald's takeout window I'd avoid. In fact, right. one one girl successfully worked at McDonald's uh, on the cash register, but they would have her clean the tables when the restaurant got busy and put her on the register when it was less busy. They just kind of made a great idea. formal accommodation there that they just did in the neighborhood, and that was successful. And then you learn a skill, and you get better at that skill, and then you master that skill, and you can move on. And then you move on. And and I'm seeing I'm seeing a lot of parents that they're uh, they overprotect their kids. And when I've suggested that their child should run in the shop and buy something when they buy gas, the mom will say, "Well, I have trouble letting go. I'm I'm afraid to do this." I said, "You're right there in front of the shop." I even can figure out, I see which gas stations in, in town I might do this at, or I could see into the shop while I'm putting the gas in the car, and have the kid run in and buy a jug of milk. I think and it's you're talking a, where fourteen year olds, sixteen year olds, and they should be doing that. Yeah, Maybe at young. six and seven, it's a little too young, but at fourteen and sixteen, absolutely. Well, absolutely, and you're right there. I mean, I just talked to mom and, the other day, and she had her daughter run into the mini mart to buy some stuff. Um, and she did it. And she did it. Well, You've got to learn the sense of money, home. too. The sense of money. A lot of but kids the- don't know it. I give Lyric $3 to, when we go into Costco to make sure he buys, he wants to get an ice cream, right? It's like $2.49 or something. I give him the 3 bucks. He has to count the change when he gets it back. And every time we go shopping, I usually make, if we're paying in cash, I let Lyric uh, learn how to give the cash and, and get the change. Well, the other way, the way I learned money, a lot of kids on the spectrum have trouble learning money. Well, back in the 50s, when I was seven and eight years old, 50 cents could buy a lot. Yeah. I could get 10 candy bars. I could get five Superman comics. <laughs> but if I wanted the 69 cent airplane, I had to save for two weeks. There were certain items that mother said are allowance items, things like popsicles, you know, six ounce Cokes. We used to get those. Um, these were all allowance items. So I was learning what 50 cents could buy in different merchandise. See, that's how I understand money. And one of my favorite toys was a table hockey set. And I saw it in the toy store window. It was $21. Oh, this wow. This was back in the 50s. That was almost a year's worth of allowance. See, that's how I understand what, now it's a $250 hockey set. But um, that's how I understand different amounts of money. Yeah. By what they can buy. I'm trying very hard with Lyric right now because the minute he gets a dollar, he wants to give it to somebody. I don't know if that's his age or a little bit of a mixture of age and ASD, but I know that I'm trying, like, Lyric, just because you get a dollar doesn't mean you give it away. He wants to give all the way. He says he wants to be the richest man on the planet so he can give all of his money away, which is very sweet. But at the same time, like, no, you got to take care of your bills and your things like that. Well, I'm. Um... And how old is your son now? He's 10. He's 10. He's probably just old enough maybe to do a little volunteer work, uh, commu- you know, something where you're right there. Like, uh, where they need, because they need to start learning how to do a task on a schedule where the family is not the boss. Oh, okay. That's really, really important. You walk Mr. Jones's door. And obviously, I'm not going to put him with a giant rock. <laughs> right. But if his dog's a miniature poodle, I think your son would be capable of walking it. You see, now I just see that. Well, that's actually pretty good because I have some neighbors that need some dogs walked, and he needs to walk our own dog. <laughs> it's important to walk your own dog, and he can walk your own dog, but he also needs to walk the dog for somebody else. Somebody else. Where somebody else outside the family is the boss. And that means he needs to be on time to walk Mr. Jones's dog. Yeah, those are little life skills that I think as parents, we all need to teach our kids. And some kids need it a little earlier and can get it a little earlier. And then some kids have to wait a little bit longer. When we get back with Temple Grandin, we're going to find out what she thinks about ABA therapy since it's kind of been raked through the coals here lately. Stay with me. Hi, I'm Larry Gilmwires. You're watching my mommy. Gina Cavalli at Life with the Spectrum. 
Welcome back to Life with the Spectrum. I'm your host, Gina Cavalli. With me today, Temple Grandin, uh, a living legend in the world of autism and um, on the spectrum yourself. ABA therapy, applied behavioral analysis. Many people have gone through it. My family has gone through it. I sat in on every single therapy session, some for multiple hours at a time. And for me and our family, Temple, it really saved our child, it addressed some behavioral issues, and we were able to get tools and techniques to help him move on and move past those behaviors. How do you personally feel about ABA? Well, originally when ABA was developed, it was a little kid's program to try to get right. them ready for normal first grade, I mean, the low loss first event. And they used a lot of harsh methods that were terrible. And uh, there's been people on the spectrum where there's a lot of harsh stuff going on, punishments, uh, forcing them into sensory overload. That's completely bad. Now, uh, this is how I counsel parents. Okay, let's say we're dealing with a three-year-old. I've got to go through the ages now again. Uh, I tell parents, you need 20 hours a week with an effective teacher. What's an effective teacher for a three-year-old? More speech, better able to wait and take turns at little games, skills like dressing and eating with utensils, and you should be making progress, and the child should like going to therapy. If the child hates therapy, then something's wrong. Now, there's a lot of rigid, old-fashioned ABA, I think, terrible. Some real, real rigid stuff. But you always have to look at, are you making progress? And I think there's a number of kids, especially fully verbal kids, where the more strict ABA stuff needs to be completely phased out when they get older. Anything that resembled ABA with me was pretty well over with by four when I started talking. Um, and it's how you do things. Uh, there's a lot of rigidity, sometimes too much emphasis on compliance and not enough emphasis on what the kid can do. I'm a big okay. proponent of, of uh, always increasing skills. So instead of stomping out a fixation on cars, I want to broaden it and make it more appropriate. There's all kinds of careers in cars, for example. Let's read about cars. We can do math with cars. We can learn about how engines work. There's science in cars. Uh, we can learn how steel is made. Cars are made out of steel. See how I'm broadening that. Um, but there's uh, some people who are you know, subjected to some really bad ABA. And another big mistake that was made in the past was some of the real strict ABA people denied sensory issues. They didn't believe that sensory problems existed. You have some sensory oh, issues yeah. of your own. You like to wear comfortable clothes. You, what right. other sensory issues? Yep, I uh, can't stand scratchy pants, especially if I have to be sitting on a plane for a long time. And when I was a little kid, I couldn't tolerate certain loud noises. Now, sometimes you can desensitize a kid to loud noise. Let the child turn on that hairdryer or turn on that vacuum cleaner where they control it. That can often help. Uh, and others have visual problems so where uh, LED lights that flicker bother them. So then find Or out. eating, the no. eating, sensory, That's you know, sensory grapes or something eating. like that. One of the ways to help with the eating is to get them involved in food prep. You're allowed to play with it in the kitchen. <coughs> Don't play with it at the dining room table. we got to manage. In the kitchen, we can play with food. Now, I'd like the kid have five things they really hate, but then other stuff, you know, they're going to need to eat. And for me, raw egg whites, like vomit. They did not make me eat that. <laughs> I do think it's funny you say that because uh, the more I get Lyric in the kitchen, and he, he doesn't have an aversion to food. He loves all different types oh, of food, and he likes to try food. food. But I'm trying to get him to learn to cook, and he's actually watching all of the seasons of Gordon Ramsay's Hell's Kitchen right now. He's uber fixated on Gordon Ramsay. I don't know why. All and right, of course but, I'm... Let's, but let's take that interest in that. Okay, now what is Gordon Ramsay cooking? So that means you're going to have to watch some of these shows some. And then let's try to work, let's try to expand that interest, and we'll make one of his recipes. Oh, and we that, have already okay, done good. that, Temple. Well, good, and it's good. He, hand writes the menu of what we're going to make. And sometimes we make it for real and sometimes we fake play if I don't have scallops or something like well, that. Yeah. Okay, but something expensive. Maybe we cut up some other fish and make them pretend scallops. Then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So listen, with your prominence in the field of autism, how do you feel like it has either helped or hindered 
in other professional areas of your life. I mean, you're a professor at Colorado State University. You go on public speaking tours nonstop. You author books. How do you feel like, what do you do in your downtime? Well, I went and I saw the Avatar movie over the holidays, oh. <laughs> and I went and I saw the Fable Man movie about young Steven Spielberg, and I learned that he was exposed to movie camera much earlier as a young child than I thought he had been. And, I go, oh boy, I can put that in my talk. Do you feel like it's helped you in other areas, being this well-known, being this famous, being able to really go out and advocate, um, not just for yourself, but also for other people on the spectrum? Well, people ask me how I feel about being walked up to an airport. And I say, it's a responsibility. I've always got to be on good behavior. That's right. I look at it as a job. It's a responsibility. And, and also, I want to... I'm a problem solver, and I want to help the kids that are different get out in good jobs. Now, I get asked what we're going to do with the schools. I put all the hands-on classes back in. Worst thing the schools ever did, because if you take all those classes out, like sewing, cooking, theater, woodworking, algebra, uh, non-algebra, uh, uh, welding, auto mechanics. Uh, Home ec, yeah. Uh, uh, those all have been taken out, but they expose students to things that can turn into careers. Oh, I think taking them out is the worst thing they ever did because we have a skill shortage in things like high-end skilled trades right now. And that goes back to taking those things out of the schools. Let's take theater. I was not interested in acting in the play, but in fourth grade, I made costumes for the school play with my singer so handy. You see, that's career interest right there. Temple in the school that is named after you, Temple Grandin School. Um, I heard through the grapevine that sometimes you pay tuition for families that... You know, what I paid uh, tuition for graduate students in the Department of Animal Science. I have probably put about 20 through either a master's program or a PhD program. Were those kids all on the spectrum? Uh, most of them were not, but I did have two that I think were undiagnosed on the spectrum. Who's your favorite person in the whole wide world? Well, that's a hard thing to say. <laughs> I know. Fire by, trial by fire questions here. Yeah, that is a trial by fire question. But I, I want to thank all the mentors I had, uh, excellent teachers. And I want to thank those excellent teachers. But I'm concerned with the visual thinking kind of mind like me, and the ones that absolutely can't do algebra, is they're just getting screened out. And some of the things that are requiring algebra for auto mechanics, you don't need algebra for auto mechanics. You see, I think some of the people that are mathematical minds think you need that for logical thinking. Yeah. And I was horrified when I did a book signing for visual thinking to find that we did it, one of the talks in a school and I talked to the principal and he didn't even know that visual thinking like my mind existed. Huh. Now I want to emphasize not everybody on the autism spectrum is a visual thinker like me. You've got some that are mathematical thinkers. They're running Silicon Valley, running all the engineering stuff. And then you've got uh, word thinkers that are on the spectrum that love history, love facts, and they, they, they think in words. You mentioned meeting people, Temple, in the airport. Has there ever been someone that you've wanted to meet? Someone, I don't know, whether they be famous, um, or not, is there somebody that you have yet to meet that you'd really like to? Well, I would have liked to have met Einstein. Yeah, right, who I wouldn't? Know, <laughs> I, know he's dead. I know he's dead. And uh, it, have you met Steven Spielberg? I met him at the uh, Emmys, very briefly. And I'm kicking myself, I wanted to find out if it was really true that he snuck into Universal Studios and took over an office. And I went and looked that up online and I got very conflicting answers. And I'm kicking myself that I forgot to ask him that. And now that you've seen the movie about him growing up and being exposed to that eight millimeter camera at such a young age, um, have you had a chance to reach out and say, hey, I loved your film or? Well, I only saw the movie like three days ago. Oh, OK. <laughs> so you still have time to write the email. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Seeing how you're exposed to so many not just famous people, but legislators, lawmakers, uh, political figures. 
Do you feel like there is real change happening? And do you feel like there's real change that is going to happen, whether it's in 2023 or a few years down the road for people on the spectrum? Well, because thing, back in the day, Temple, they were put in a sane asylum. Well, like back in the day, I was the kind of kid that would have just been put in an institution. I had very severe symptoms. At, and, and it was back in 1949. My mother took me to a neurologist who didn't even know what autism was. Right. That's why the diagnosis came a little later. Today, I would have landed smack in an autism program. I was the kind of kid they used to just get rid of. And then the more Asperger's type, socially awkward, no speech delay, most of those went into the workforce. I have granddads and grandmoms come up to me all the time that discover they're on the spectrum when the kids get diagnosed. I'm seeing that happen over and over again. Yeah. And where getting diagnosed later in life has been helpful is on relationships. Yes. I think now I think uh, they're getting held back with the diagnosis on the job front because there's a hesitancy to get the kids out doing things. So do you think there could be real change ahead of us um, as more companies start hiring a more diverse workforce? I do a lot of talks to big companies. I've done U.S. Steel. I've done IBM. I've done an airline. I've done pharmaceutical companies. And I emphasize you need these neurodiverse minds. You need them. Yeah. And you need to pay you them. Need people like me, you need people like me as visualization to help solve problems that you also need your mathematical minds. Well, let's just take something like, why did Zoom take over from the other platforms? Because I didn't have to learn how to use it. You see, that's interface. That's interface. And also this Riverside's really easy to Is use. It e <laughs> I don't want to have to learn how to use software. <laughs> right. And, and. But you see, that's the interface. You see, the engineering mind tends to put too many bells and whistles on it. In individual thinking, I talk about the collaboration between Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs. Wozniak, typical computer geek, let's have five expansion slots on that computer. And, and Jobs goes, no, I want it simple and pretty so that people can use it. You see, that's the different kinds of minds. And I... And, um, I've been looking at the whole Southwest ma mess and I'm imagining an app for the flight crews where they could get scheduled. And I don't have to have some powerful computing power behind this because they have a point to point system. And I'm going to have to get my best math heads to put the, 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 the computing power behind that where they can just go on an app and, and punch in that they've landed in Phoenix, flight number such and such. That will link up with the transponder number automatically. And where it's a very simple interface that they don't even have to learn how to use. See, maybe you develop the next big app for all the airlines. Look at you, Temple. Well, actually, the other airlines just seem to work fine. You see, they have hub and spoke system. But it's like, how could they have let this mess happen? You see, they, they, they had another debacle in 2021 that wasn't as bad. But you see, what I'm learning, it's not stupidity that makes a mess like this. It's not seeing it. The verbal thinker doesn't see it. It's not stupidity. They don't see it. Hmm. You need the different kinds of minds. When I talked to the steel company, I said, I'm going to bet you that your maintenance people out in that shop are getting gray. You need to check out the people fixing elevators and escalators. Hmm. Half of them are gray. Right. Last two airplane mechanics on my flights have been gray. Yes, he was entering his FFA stuff on an iPad, but he was gray. Got it. They're not getting replaced. And some of the people that would be ideal for some of these jobs would be on the autism spectrum. For sure. But how would they find out they like mechanics if they don't get exposed to it? Yeah. You see, that's the thing. Because I've worked with people. I worked with one guy. He was not autistic. But he one welding class. He has a multi-jillion dollar contracting company in a corporate chat. High school grad. Wow. You see, this is where there's a whole world out there in industry. I talk to a lot of big businesses, and I tell them, you need these diverse minds. You need them. You need diverse minds so you wouldn't have a mess like the Southwest scheduling complete. You know what? Up, I won't use the word. Yeah. <laughs> Please don't. Hey, when we get back with Temple no, Grandin, won't. we're going to ask some trial by fire questions and see what she has to say. Stay with me. Hi, I'm Lear Gilmore's. Thanks to our friends at 
Welcome back to Life with the Spectrum. I'm Gina Cavalli. With me today, the living legend herself, Temple Grand. And thank you again for being on the show, Temple. Well, it's great to be here. I had some viewers ask me some quick questions. Uh, they wanted to know what your favorite type of music was. Well, I have to say I love the rock and roll of our generation. I got a new car and uh, uh, a satellite service Sirius XM of vinyl classics was one of the stations that somehow got put on there. I really like that. And I like country. But I like okay. some classical, too. I, I like a variety of, of things. I'm... I like song. I like music that has some melody. Okay. Um, another question came in. Uh, what is your favorite type of food, and where is your favorite type of place to go eat it? Well, I like a variety of things. Uh, I'm an Eastern originally, and when I first moved to Arizona, I said, "Well, I hate Mexican food." You know what? Actually, I love Mexican food now. You see, that's after I after I've tried it. You see, I was an Easterner, so when I moved out to Arizona, I didn't have Mexican food back east where I lived. And then I found that I liked it, as long as it wasn't too hot. Most of it <laughs> Too <hot>. spicy? <laughs> well, yeah, there's some that's, you know, so spicy it's ridiculous. But, I, you know, you don't know until you try different things. Right. What, uh, what would you say uh, you do? Do you play video games was one of the questions. Well, what little video game playing I've, I've played, I think this is like a drug. I want to stay away from it. Yeah, because the problem what I'm seeing, I'm seeing what I'm seeing with uh, fully verbal adults, two paths. Let's go out and have a life or in the basement to play video games. And they're not becoming they're not becoming video game designers. I wouldn't criticize it. They got wonderful jobs in that industry. I wouldn't criticize it, but they're not getting wonderful jobs. Yeah. And then I'm finding out, you see, my kind of mind, I can be the worst on getting addicted to them. And and they never grew up using a tool. You become reclusive when you're playing video well, games all the time. Problem. You're not going now out and meeting people. Well, now there's somewhere you can do those multiplayer games and get some friends there. So I don't want to ban it. Right. But eight hours a day, that's not acceptable. <laughs> Two hours a day, maybe, but not, not eight hours a day. And where I've seen successes in getting young adults off of video games and into the workforce has been car mechanics. My mind thinks in specific examples. There's now five or six specific examples where car mechanics slowly introduced worked and ended up in employment. And one of the guys is fixing trains for the railroad. And they engineering. Yeah, anything engineering, mechanical. Well, see, the thing with engineering, there's two parts of engineering here. There's the visual, non-mathematical part. Uh -huh. I call that the clever engineering department. And then there's degreed mathematical part. And when you look at who builds a big food processing plant or a big meat plant, and I've worked for a major company, the clever engineering department makes mechanically clever equipment. And most of the people I worked with barely graduated from high school. But they could design anything, all kinds of patents. Hmm. And then the degreed engineer does power, water, boilers, uh, refrigeration systems, things that require more mathematics. And the people I worked with, none of them could do algebra. I think we need to be thinking our curriculum, maybe business math instead. That's what they need to have. Do you know... Personally, the the gentleman Don Donald T. He was the first person in the United States to be diagnosed with um, autism spectrum disorder. Oh, that's the one that was the uh, teller at the bank. He likes yeah. to play golf. Yeah, just in a different key. The movie that came out. Yeah, and uh, but that's a good example. I remember reading about him, and he liked to count things. So they had him like plow a field and count the furrows. Yeah. He has and, a great mathematical mind there. He can tell you yep, he, the day uh, of the week it was back in 19, you know, 30, uh, when it came to, you know, what was this date or what was this day? He has a brilliant mind like that. Well, if I remember right, he got a job at a bank as a teller and kept mm -hmm. it. Yep. Now that's something it's not, you see, it's not multitasking. Banks are quiet. You deal with one customer at a time and the things you have to do are, are totally routine. There's this procedure for each thing you have to learn. Right. Temple, who's your favorite author? Oh, when I was a child, I I loved The Wizard of Oz when I was a little kid. I yeah. Black Beauty, the book Black Beauty when I was a kid. That was a good, that was a good book. It was a good movie yeah. too. <laughs> but I had both, the, uh, you know, the children's version of Black Beauty when I was young and, and uh, the grown-up version later on. Temple, when you leave this world, 
What are some things that you want to be remembered for? Well, making doing something makes a positive difference. And I want to and I want to see the kids that are think differently and get into good jobs they're really going to like because that helps give a satisfying life where you get friends through shared interests. And people I've been with that have had successful marriages, it's friends who shared interests, like two computer programmers getting together. I remember one of the, like Jennifer, was in, uh, and the lady said she talked to me in one of her talks about, oh, you've got to have a really romantic discussion <laughs> in a candlelit restaurant about computer data storage systems <laughs> because they are just so interesting. You see, now I can relate to that. I can relate to that. One of the problems I have with, with highly social situations, these chit chat back and forth situations, I can't follow them. I do not have the processor speed to follow that. So when I go to a party, I usually one-on-one -on -one talk to, you know, to different people one at a time. Okay. Because you get into a real fast, on these rhythmic chit-chat. I can't follow it. I see. You see, like stand-up comedians I don't really like because by the time I'm laughing at one joke, he said three more. It goes by too fast. That auditory processing so, was... Uh, I did well, a show on that with one of my best girlfriends and... I learned something to slow down. Slow down. And when you're working with the little kids trying to get them to talk, here's another tip. Talk slowly. Give them time to respond. They're like a phone with only one bar of service. It takes time for it to download a web page. Give it time to respond. Uh, I, I agree with that. You know, they, what, what's, and when I think about the people I've worked with in industry, you know, some of the best times we had was just talk, sitting around talking about how to build stuff. That was some of our best conversations. And, you know, for me, you know, there's some, I realize I'm missing some things in life, but I had somebody say to me just the other day, boy, all the stuff you do, you've had a really full life. And you have, and you continue yeah, and, to be and, an yeah. advocate and a spokesperson for a whole bunch of people that need it, that can't speak for themselves right now. Well, I also want to mention about nonverbal. And in all my formal talks, I talk about uh, uh, nonverbal people who have learned to type independently. And they have a good brain inside, but they can't um, control their movements. Uh, sensory scrambling may be happening in, in vision. Um, and one, uh, there's some really good books. Um, Tito Makapatahe, How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move? The Reason I Jump by Noki, the Japanese. He's now a man now. And the sequel to that book's better. The sequel's better. He's older and he has more insight. And then there's Carly's voice. And, and they're typing completely independently. And then I went to a school called Celebrate the Children in New Jersey just about a month ago. And they're working with nonverbal adults, and they were actually teaching them to use rather expensive cameras, and they were not mm. breaking them. And mm. they, then they treat them like they've got a brain inside, and I've watched them do this. The other thing I noticed there, there was almost no damage to the facility. I found one dented door somebody had punched. And that was it. And, and uh, you treat them like they've got a brain inside, a lot of them behave a lot better. What's the first thing and the last thing you think about when you wake up and you go to bed? Well, I don't know. Usually when I go to bed, I just you know, think about, you know, going to sleep. I found... Have, you don't think about what you have coming no, up the next I day? Do. I think about that. Yep. And I have a schedule. Think about stuff I got to do the next day. I mean, even today, I've got to like do stuff like, you know, get the bills paid. Uh, <laughs> go get my prescription, you know, just stuff like that. And writing a prescription, I do take... Uh, antidepressant medication that saved me. And I wrote about that in, in my book, uh, Thinking in Pictures. I have a whole chapter on that. A lot of kids are on medication, young adults and adults in general. And do you think they're over-medicated or do you think it takes a, a right mixture sometimes finding that right cocktail balance, so to speak? Well, there's way too many drugs given out to young children. Way too many. Way too many. And I'm appalled when I talk, especially low-income parents are on Medicaid. Kids on seven drugs, he's eight years old, 
And then when I ask them why they did these different drugs, they don't know. They were just writing prescriptions. The thing that appalled me was the lack of thought that went into it. It was absolutely terrible. I'm, but on the other hand, I take one little antidepressant, and I started in my late, in my early 30s, and the nonstop colitis attacks I had cleared up within a week because I wasn't under such a constant state of stress. Right. And so a little bit of the right medication can make a big difference. Temple, what kind of big things are coming up in 2023 for you? What do you have planned? Well, I've got lots of speaking engagements um, planned. That's uh, one of the things I'm doing because I'd like to and like to see the uh, kids on the spectrum um, get out and have good lives. When do you come through Atlanta? I don't think I've got anything in Atlanta. I've got a whole bunch of stuff in Orlando coming up. And I'm still doing a lot of um, uh, animal behavior talks, veterinary conferences. See, being a visual thinker helped me in my animal behavior work. Animals don't think of words. They're sensory based. They're not word based. And I, the thing I also want to emphasize, because I talk to a lot of businesses, you know, large corporations, is what these people can do and that these corporations actually need their skills. Yeah, the leaders are only as good as their team. And what I've learned when I was younger, and I didn't know about the different kinds of minds, I used to call it stupidity. What I've learned, they did not, they don't see it. Verbal thinkers overgeneralize. Well, Temple, I can't thank you enough for being on the show. I, I want to extend, um, uh, uh, just if you ever come through Atlanta, you have my phone number now. I'd love to take you out for coffee, bring Lyric with me or take you out for an ice cream and uh, and just chew some more fat with you. Because I just think that everything that you've done and everything you continue to do is really being a force for good in the world where so many of us live in right now. Well, I want to see the other thing is when I when my work with animals, and I think it's some parallels here. You know, some people say, oh, everything about animals treated dish horrible. Well, I don't, there's no way I can work on everything's terrible. I picked out cattle handling. That's something specific that I could work yeah. on. And I started and out you with did. working on the equipment, and then I wrote about it. Wrote about how to do it. And now 60% of North American cattle ranchers are using your system when they go to slaughter. And then the other thing is... They have to manage the equipment. Before we started the McDonald's audits, I had a lot of equipment out there that was, well, some people tore it up and broke it. And then when a big buyer says, you're gonna have to do things right, then they had to repair and manage that equipment. Well, I, again, I can't thank you enough for coming on. And please, whenever you're in Atlanta, call me. I'll pick you up at the airport. I'll take you out to dinner or something. I just, I just adore you and I think, thank you. Thank you for being one of the pioneers in this journey that so many people not only live on, like my son, but as family members, we live with. And that's why I called the show Life with the Spectrum, because Wait, I'm not on the wait, spectrum, wait, but my wait, son what's is. His, what's your son's big What's his big interest? Um, Lyric's big interest right now is two things. Uh, one, playing video games. All right. But he's very uber He's uber focused on presidents. He knows the history. He All knows. Right, that's more of a, he knows. Okay. We're ta we're taking him Temple. We're taking him to Washington D.C. for his spring break. I you can only make reservations to go to the White House like ninety days in advance. Although I did write President Joe a letter and said, Hey, it's Autism Awareness Month. It just so happens that we're going to be there. If you could take five minutes, and of course I got the standard response from the White well, House. Well, I can remember going on the tour of the White House when I was a child. And uh, but I, I remember going on a trip to Washington and uh, seeing where they print the money. Yeah, oh, that was fascinating. Yeah, uh, you can take him to the Capitol building. You know, let's uh, learn about you know, what, you know let's learn about how the you know the legislature works. Oh, the yeah, House he's the Senate, um, and see some of those things. Now, if he's interested in presidents, he might be. You see, the, when I look back to the kinds of thinking. The verbal type autistic tends to love stuff like presidents, flags, memorize all the state capitals. Yes, I think that's lyric, oh, hands yeah. down. But Temple, thank you again so much for being on the show. I appreciate your time today.
Yeah, it was great to be here. Wow. Temple Grandin to kick off 2023 right here at Life with the Spectrum. Whew. What a force to be reckoned with, right? (laughs) And not for nothing, some of the things that you didn't hear off camera that we talked about were uh, giving kids choices, especially in ABA. You get this or that, and then you have to stick with that choice. Other things that Temple and I talked about off camera were was a little bit on that auditory uh, processing and just to be patient. You know, sometimes people talk so fast or you have multiple people talking at you. And for folks on the spectrum, they just need to take a minute and let it sink in before they can give that verbal response for those who are verbal. And then backdoor jobs. We talked a lot about that because in 2022 and really the course of time, it's not what you know, it's who you know, right? And so if you know a business owner or you know somebody that can employ a person on the spectrum, maybe reach out to them and see if you can't get your young adult or adult a good job. You know, there more companies are hiring diverse workforces And it's because of people like Temple Grandin that have gone out to work very hard on making sure that that happens. So, again, uh, in 2023, the sky's the limit on this show. We're going to be talking to leaders and pioneers and doctors and more schools, because I know that's a big one for families. As we continue to live this crazy journey called life, we continue to live life with the spectrum. Thanks for stopping by and make sure you subscribe below. See ya. Bye.